hear from the next panelist. Good evening, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, people around the world. My name is James Gilligan. I was a former corporal in the United States Marine Corps. I was promoted to sergeant on inactive duty. I served from 1999 to 2005. I participated in Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. I served in Afghanistan in 2004 for six months in Iraq in the initial invasion, as well as in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba on the fence line. Please cue my slides. Slides, please. There's 13 slides. Find them. I'm going to continue on while somebody goes ahead and tracks that down. Mike Totten. In 2004 in Afghanistan, I was a corporal gunner on a Humvee. My lieutenant was in front of me. My sergeant was on my side. I was behind the weapon. My entire platoon was taking a knee as my lieutenant was going over our next mission. On a mountain range approximately five and a half to six kilometers out, there was a blast and a flash. I was the only person in my entire unit to see this flash. The shock wave came over to us and everybody took a knee and everybody looked around. Nobody could find out where it was coming from. Immediately I got on the Prick 119 radio and I radioed over that Echo 4 Golf myself had seen the flash and I could give directions to it. My Master Sergeant, Top, had come across the radio and asked for the azimuth, which is the direction in which it came from. I pulled out my GPS. It was unfortunately too slow, so I pulled out my compass. When I pulled out my compass, I made the grave error of taking a compass reading next to a 240 machine gun, which had a, a high amount of metal content in it. The end. I gave the false azimuth. Hold on. I gave the false azimuth, and the top took my azimuth as true. He then asked for the distance at which the blast was, and I told him it was approximately five and a half to six kilometers. This I did under the supervision of my lieutenant and my sergeant. They launched one barrage of mortars, 81 millimeters, and asked me if I had eyes on the target and if I had seen impact. I had said no. They fired again and again. And on the fourth barrage, I was already turning the road and we were pulling away to go for a more secured position. I had reported back that they were, this target was out of range and I was unable to spot rounds anymore and I did not see any smoke or any mortars impact. They continued to fire a fifth and sixth barrage into an Afghani village. Members of the scout sniper team were in, an, in a hide up in the mountain and had been called down into the village to perform emergency triage on numerous casualties. <clears throat> Later that night, they called me over their tent and they asked me if I was qualified to call for fire. And I told them I was not qualified. However, I was asked and I gave the responses needed to, to quickly assess the danger and proceed forward with the mission. My sergeant came over and luckily intervened before anything got hostile. There was no repercussion. Approximately a week later, we performed a med cap on the same area. And when we went back, there was obvious signs of aerial attack all over the village. And typically on a med cap, we perform to give shots, do minor dentistry, check the babies and stuff. And it was only after pulling out of that village that we were also hit by an IED. Later on, I was informed that through translators and interpreters, our unit had informed, this is again what I was told, that our unit had informed the Afghanis of the village that if the Taliban does it again, if you let us know. 
in 2004 in Afghanistan. Please find my slides. In 2004 in Afghanistan, again, scout sniper team was observing forward observers that were in the they were in the procedure of spotting rounds as rockets were coming in from Pakistan being fired at our base in Afghanistan. There were three gentlemen, two men and one teenage boy. The scout snipers could have easily taken out and suppressed and cut off the, uh, the, the attack. They would not have been able to fire without a forward observer. However, the scout snipers and our unit deemed that it would be necessary that we puck them, personnel under custody. I informed my sergeant that I could plan this, this puck procedure. I emplaced an 81 millimeter mortar platoon at the base of a hill, and I had two cat gun trucks, combined any armor team, hide and defilade. I then called in air support with a Black Hawk helicopter and a Huey. The Black Hawk helicopter landed on our hillside and picked up immediately 10 to 15 Marines, hard charge and devil dogs, picked them up and brought them over to the next hilltop. At that point in time, these three Afghanis were obviously very scared. They had no weapons that I could see physically. The Huey gunship orbiting opened fire on the Afghanis as they were running down the hillside trying to get away from our gentlemen. But it was obvious that we had a tactical and we had, superiority, we had superiority. There was no way that they could have gotten away. And it just did not seem right that you could open fire on three people running away from 15 Marines running down a hill <laughs> ready to arrest you. In 2004, in Afghanistan, in 2004 in Afghanistan, it is SOP to find weapon caches and to blow them up. I had found one of the largest weapons caches that I had ever seen, 10 yards by 20 yards, encompassing two rooms, approximately six feet tall, everything from mines to anti-aircraft. Let me tell you, this was a very, very big weapons cache. It took us several hours to pull out. It took us several hours to load up on a seven ton. Then we drove it out to the range. And then in the morning, we were informed that the Afghani police force, that this was their private weapons cache. This happened in 2004, just as we were securing President Karzai's election. I feel that this was a grave mistake, and I feel that this was going against our standard procedure and our ROEs for finding the, such munitions. And such munitions should not be, as they were, unguarded, unprotected, and in such great number. In 2004, Afghanistan, I operated as a tunnel rat. If anybody has any idea about joining the United States military, you should probably consider the tunnel rat position. First, you strip down to your waist. Then, you put a pistol in one hand and a flashlight in another hand. Then you crawl inside of a tunnel that is this big. Ladies and gentlemen, I weigh about 145 to 150 pounds. You crawl in a tunnel about this big, and you crawl as far as you can until something either bites you, the tunnel caves in, or you find something. 